Well, welcome everybody. Um, it's great to see so many of you here. Um, this is our second panel discussion, uh, the second installment, you might say, um, in our Campus Conversation, which is an, a program we're doing all year. Um, and it's sponsored by my office, the Office of the Provost. By the way, my name is Susan Poser. I'm the Provost. I should have started with that. Um, and this is intended as a way uh, to learn about the issues that are affecting our lives and have a community discussion um, about them. Um, today's presentation, the election of 2016, engagement, conflict, and the common good, what's going on and why, um, will be followed next Monday at noon by an open forum on the same topic. And at the open forum, um, there's a lot of opportunity for discussion both within small groups and as a larger group. Um, we have, I'll also mention that next month in November, the topic will be immigration, migration, and displacement, what's going on and why. And again, we will have a, a panel discussion or a lecture followed uh, in a week or so by an open forum. Um, we have three very distinguished panelists today. I'm not going to spend a lot of time um, introducing them. I think that um, Professor Simpson will introduce um, our uh, external uh, speakers a little more. Um, our moderator is our very own Professor Dick Simpson, uh, Professor of Political Science at UIC, and an expert on elections, urban politics, and public corruption. Um, on the panel um, is uh, Dr. Benjamin Page, the Gordon Scott Fulcher Professor of Decision Making at the Department of Political Science science at Northwestern University. Um, Professor Page's interests include public opinion and policy making, the mass media, empirical democratic theory, political economy, policy formation, the presidency, and the American foreign policy. Our other panelist um, is Laura S. Washington. Um, Ms. Washington is a columnist for the Chicago Sun-Times and a political analyst for ABC7 Chicago. She's formerly the Ida B. Wells Barnett University professor at DePaul University in Chicago. Laura Washington is a multimedia journalist specializing in media-related issues, African-American affairs, local and national politics, race and racism, and social justice. She is a veteran political investigative a journalist, um, and I won't go into it, but if you look at her webpage, you'll see that she's also um, gotten many, many awards for her work. So again, I want to thank you all for coming, um, and with uh, no more ado, I will give you Professor Dick Simpson to talk about the election of 2016. Thank you. So I just want to make a couple of other announcements. Uh, the bookstore has books on the election and the Constitution, in case you need your own pocket copy of the Constitution, and other books on uh, urban politics. They're for sale out front. And you may see I have a different uh, UIC button than the red one you normally see. Uh, this is UIC Votes. Uh, today we're switching as we finish up the registration campaign uh, to try and build the voting of the students and faculty at UIC in this all-important election. Uh, I think the, the introductions were adequate, and Ben, I'm going to ask you to start out uh, with talking about uh, this, some of the special aspects of this campaign. Thank you, Dick. Always good to be down here, escape the suburbs, <laughs> enter real life, at least briefly. Um, <laughs> We'll be talking about a lot of aspects of the election, but I want to highlight the Trump phenomenon and what I think it means in the long run, not just what's likely to happen this November, but what happens afterwards. And as you can tell from my title, I think it's fair to, to think about the breakup of the Republican Party in exactly what sense we can talk about later. That's my favorite Trump photo. It's really nasty. Tried to find a nasty one of Clinton, but she controls her images so well that it's really hard to find a nasty one. Maybe you, I'll, I'll look further. You haven't been on the Drudge Report lately then, have you, Ben? Oh, yeah. I'm sorry, I haven't. <laughs> if, you look, if you look at Fox and look at some of the conservative websites, there's a lot of nasty <laughs> photos of her out oh, there. Oh, I won't <laughs> have an excuse. I have, to, I have to use one. Now, it seems to me maybe the number one fact about this election, let's stare at this one for, for a minute, if you'll indulge me. Number one fact is probably that both the major party candidates are pretty unpopular by historical standards. This thing, what's going on here is the vertical axis is what proportion of Americans have a very unfavorable, unfavorable attitude toward, toward candidates. Uh, the horizontal is election year, so each dot is a presidential candidate. 
They're kind of hooked together by parties red and blue, which is a little misleading. I mean, it's not the same people. Um, although some people have claimed there's a trend toward unpopularity in that graph. But I think the key point is just absolutely obvious that Donald Trump is the most unpopular candidate we've had in many years. And Hillary Clinton's a pretty close runner-up. That means the whole setting of this election is very different from what we're used to. Um, some, you can see some cases like the, the early George W. Bush where hardly anybody disliked him. Of course, then he had a war and you notice the, the spike. Um, okay, so unpopular candidates. And let's focus on Trump for a minute. I have a feeling this may not look like the value-free social science that I was kind of trained to do. You know, you're, you're not supposed to have opinions, you're not supposed to feel anything. But believe me, this is all objective truth. I mean, at least there's substantial evidence for each of those propositions. Trump is a very interesting and unusual character. Um, and I'm not going to belabor any one of those. Um, but considering, if you believe half of that, the question is, why has this guy done so well? I mean, he beat, what was it, 16 or 17 Republicans in the primaries. He's been running for certain periods neck and neck with Hillary Clinton, one of the most experienced and prepared <laughs> candidates we've ever had. Why? Well. I, I mentioned the first point, which is weak opposition on the Democratic side, but the, uh, the Republican side, I would say the opposition has been weak also. Amazing, given kind of the distinguished credentials of some of these candidates, but I'll, I'll explain why I, why I think that. And obviously Trump has characteristics like his celebrity um, that are important in his appeal. I would highlight the, the last two points there, that there are a bunch of Americans who feel battered, primarily by economic globalization and the information revolution and so forth. There are a whole flock of people, especially older white males, who have really been having a rough time and think both parties have betrayed them. And then there's a social side of that, I would say, that is related demographic changes, um, you know, the, the growth in our Latino population, African Americans are more prominent, even have a president, African American, and so social resentment and unease and so forth comes into the mix too. This is pretty obvious. Those are reasons that Trump has substantial appeal. Who does he appeal to? We know this too. It's primarily older working class, lower education men. That doesn't mean you have to have all those characteristics to like Trump. It means each of those characteristics tends to lead people to like Trump. And especially in, in rural areas, in the South, Rocky Mountains, Rust Belt, some of the plains. And I think it's, to link this to what I said about economic distress, the Wall Street Journal had a really remarkable thing, especially for them, because they're big free traders, of course. But they showed that where Chinese imports have devastated communities, there's a whole lot of Trump support. Nice little analysis. It's also true, many of you probably noticed these studies that all of a sudden death rates have actually been rising among certain demographic groups, especially, again, older white men, middle to older. Suicide, accidents, disease, crummy health care, lots of reasons, but many of them probably traced to those economic factors I mentioned. So these people have real reasons to be upset, and I think they have real reasons to be upset with both parties. Uh, would Trump help them? I'm skeptical. But who knows? Um, they think he would. Now we get to what I think is the real nitty gritty about the weakness of Trump's primary opponents and why he did so well. Um, 
if you put them in different bunches, there's one big bunch of sort of establishment candidates who are roughly McCain, Romney, uh, brought up to date. Jeb Bush, Marco Rubio, Scott Walker, or Chris Christie, some others you could, you could say. But the fact is, that was not selling this year, even among the Republican base, even among the Republican voters. They didn't like these guys. They just didn't like them. And some of them are very accomplished, as I say. They have you know, extensive records of public service, very smart, photogenic, et cetera. They got wiped out. Ted Cruz, you remember, was number two in this thing. Ted Cruz is kind of a strange case because almost everyone who has worked with him or for him seems to dislike him. And in the US Senate especially, it's hard to find more than two senators who say they're on friendly terms. His big support comes, I would say, and there's evidence for this, comes from social conservatives. He buys the whole economic conservative platform of the Republican Party, but his distinctive thing is his social conservatism, so that he had some of the same Trump appeal um, to people who feel social resentment, race, and other reasons. Um, the, and you notice that Cruz did really well in the primaries, not the primaries, in the caucuses, not the primaries. He did well with activists in the caucuses. Um, so I would say that the, the two fundamental things happening to the Republican Party here are that the establishment Republicans, in fact, all of them were seen by Republican voters as too pro-rich. You don't get a whole lot of publicity about that, especially not from Republicans. Uh, but this idea of endless tax cuts for the rich is not selling anymore, even among Republicans. Uh, but also, I think most Republican voters and most Americans reject the extreme social conservatism of a Ted Cruz type. So if you focus on those two, two last points, that to me is a big part of my story, a big part of what is happening. When I meant to say that rouses with no result, you notice the, the, the party has inflamed social resentment and tension. Some would say, you know, racism, certainly xenophobia, but hasn't done anything about it. Part of Trump, um, part of Trump's appeal is he can say, these establishment guys, they're talking our language, but they're not doing anything that's really socially conservative. So Page's argument is roughly this, that the Reagan coalition, which roughly speaking consisted of social conservatives and economic conservatives, most of whom don't really like each other, um, but they got along for a while. They had anti-communism, abortion, various things. Um, they're falling apart. And it's largely activists versus big money people. The big money people, corporate CEOs and so forth, have pretty clear aims from public policy. They want to be left alone by the government, Little regulation, low taxes, free trade. A lot of them like immigration for low cost labor, high tech, some, low skills, some. Um, but these Republican candidates, like the, the establishment one, ones I mentioned, were, and all the Republican officials are basically stuck embracing two sets of unpopular policies, I would say extreme economic conservatism and extreme social conservatism. There's such an orthodoxy that you could hardly tell the difference among the candidates. They all want tax cuts for the wealthy, they all, et cetera, et cetera. When I say, pardon? Yeah, I should be able to do it in less than that. Um, so Trump's big secret is no, secret at all, that is, because he was wealthy, he could say go to hell to the donors, at least for a while. You know, that caused trouble later, and it's causing big trouble now. But for a while, he could be independent. He could go against these unpopular policies, some of them that both parties embraced that are unpopular, like free trade without helping out the people very much who are wiped out by it. 
There's a good argument for free trade. There's a terrible argument for not helping people who are hurt by it because there are gains from trade that could be shared. Um, Trump, you can, you can see my little list of, of some of his more or less positions. Um, all of them break away from party orthodoxy. Several of them are more popular than the Democrats' positions. So, what this means to me is, no matter how this election comes out, the Republican Party's got a big problem. Paul Ryan, you know, sort of the hero of, of uh, Washington, D.C. Republicans, his basic economic conservatism, if you look at the pieces of it, are extremely unpopular with average Americans. He's mostly very quiet about cutting Social Security and so forth. Big conflicts between different wings of the party. And the question is, how would you put back together some kind of coalition like the Reagan uh, deal? And I'm not going to go into great detail, but it seems to me it's hard to imagine exactly what kind of coalition would put this all back together. The best I can think of for the party would be to go back to Eisenhower and Nixon. Uh, sort of moderate policies, except the New Deal and so forth. But would that be acceptable to big money people? Here's another one to stare at for a minute. We better use one of our three remaining minutes looking at this. Um, this is from a little survey we did in the Chicago area of a random sample of wealthy people, and it's kind of the best data on what wealthy people want from government. You see from at the top, you notice there's these millionaires. It tells what percentage favor things on the left. Then next to that, what percentage of citizens in national surveys. And then on the right is just a little, you know, it's the difference between the two. Those differences are big. If you go down the columns, you keep seeing that things that large majorities of Americans favor are opposed by wealthy Americans. Um, and that applies to those job-related policies at the beginning. It, provide, it applies to health care, social security, education, economic regulation, and taxes. That's a lot of policies right there on which there are very sharp disagreements. Both parties have got a problem. This is a system that's a wash in money. The people with the money tend to have beliefs like that. So both parties get pushed basically to the right on these kind of economic and social welfare issues. But the Republicans even more than the Democrats. Um, well, who knows what's going to happen. I won't even say anything about it. We have, we have the experts here. Um, but here's a point to remember that Trump's existence has kind of masked the Democrats' problems. And I think they're very serious. It's not just that Hillary Clinton's unpopular. It's partly the reason she is. Some of them have to do with the Goldman Sachs connection, which is very strong for both Clinton's treasury secretaries and so forth, uh, linked to investment bankers who have systematically pushed the Democratic Party to the right on a number of important issues. Then Senate, maybe we'll want to talk about, but that, that looks tough despite it being a perfect year, tough for the Democrats. And the big thing I don't mention there is the gerrymandering in a sense of the Senate, the fact that rural areas are way overrepresented and that helps the Republicans. The House is set up in such a way that it's really hard for Democrats to win. Um, so this says a little more about my, my point about the Democrats' troubles. The Democrats are not really a working people's party the way they were at the time of Franklin Roosevelt. And we can maybe talk about that um, in our discussion. And it seems to me, I've personally been disappointed um, to see that the establishment Democrats just don't seem to get that. You know, I've had furious arguments with some of them about if, hey guys, you're out of touch with a large part of the electorate. They don't seem to understand it. So my bottom line is the party system's likely to change. The Republican Party's not going to be the same. Um, 
and the Democrats are going to have some problem too. In the short run, I expect a low turnout election, a lot of angry people, whoever wins, very unhappy election. Um, oh yeah, and we have to watch for WikiLeaks. Uh, who knows what they've got on Hillary, but it's going to come out. Um, and then, as I say, breakup of the Republicans. Democrats are going to have problems. If Hillary wins, there'll be a low-level civil war with uh, the progressive side of the Democratic Party, probably. 2018 is slated to be a total disaster for the Democrats unless somebody pulls off a miracle. So now I think we're, we're ready for the final slide, advertising proportion. Uh, pardon me, portion of, of my slides. This is a book Marty Gillins and I are working on that diagnoses all the problems of democracy in America, tells us how we can solve them, and then makes hopeful noises that we really might do it. Thanks. So I want to make um, just six or seven main points, and I'll start uh, picking up with uh, the kind of uh, dichotomy and, and the difficulties that uh, Ben Page pointed out. And I think it's fair to say that at this election, um, maybe more than many since 1968, uh, we're truly at a crossroads. Now, whether we come out of it on a particular road and come out well is a whole different question, but we're making some fundamental questions about the future of our country. We're also making, as Ben suggested in the last couple of slides, a decision about who's going to control Congress, and that will make a big difference no matter who is president. And we're making finally here in Illinois, since the state doesn't deign to fund us very often at this university, uh, we're making a decision as to who's going to control the legislature in Illinois and whether we'll have a budget, solve the pension problem, and our more local problems. But I wanted to make, uh, before I got into the specifics of where we are and the crossroads and the choices, to make the point that you may be the ones that are the deciders. Um, you've seen constantly in our uh, newspaper things like the rock the vote effort that was here. I want to tell you that uh, we have registered more students to vote at UIC than at any time in UIC's history. This, for you, is a history-making election. And in case you didn't get to register, there's a registration booth right outside. And faculty, staff, and students can register to vote. Now, our record in the past at UIC has not been particularly distinguished. In 2012, we did pretty well in registration. 67% of the students eligible to register did register. Uh, but only 41% voted. Uh, 2012 was a fairly significant election. Uh, I was in great doubt whether Obama would be reelected. And in 2014, it got much more abysmal. Only 20% of the student population at UIC voted. Uh, but we've changed that a bit. Last spring in the primaries, which uh, did have a strange collection of candidates in Democratic and Republican primary, and we were late in the season, uh, but still viable as an, a primary, uh, we registered more than 350 students here at UIC. But this summer and since, we have registered 781 students, not counting all of you who are going to rushing out to register at the end of this meeting and the Rock the Vote event that's occurring Thursday and so on, and so the National Student Issues Convention that's occurring Friday. We will have registered more than 1,000 new students, uh, or new voters, among the student population at UIC. Our goal is to uh, register at least 75% um, of the students who are eligible to vote and to get more than 60% of you to vote, whichever candidate and candidate, not only the top of the ticket, but I think Laura and I will talk some about the, uh, the Senate race and the, down, uh, the lower down ballot uh, elections. And to make that particularly easy for you down the hall and uh, up the building and down the hall in room 603, on November 2nd to 4th, we have early voting. It's the second time in the history of UIC that we've had, we had early voting in the primary. That worked well. We're expecting to do better than that uh, in this uh, November election. Now, I think Ben is right in the sense that this election 
uh, overriding theme is that voters are profoundly angry. Uh, one of the clear indications was the uh, Republicans elected Donald Trump on the Republican side, and Bernie Sanders won a huge number of primaries and a large number of votes from people who were angry uh, on the Democratic side. In addition, also a point that Ben raised in his slide, he talked about how many people dislike both candidates. The primary reason for the vote for one-third of the people on supporting Trump and one-third of the people supporting Clinton is that they hate the other candidate. It's not that they like their candidate necessarily, most of them don't, but they're voting because they literally hate the candidate on the other side. We don't usually have elections that are quite that divisive. In addition, this election has several unique uh, characteristics or more extreme characteristics than the last elections. Uh, first of all, the Citizens United and other court cases uh, have unleashed upon us super PACs with no limits and who hide their contributors. So we have dark money affecting the election. How does that affect it here in Illinois? We have a half dozen elections for state legislator, single legislative district, in which more than $2 million has already been spent. So if you want to run for state legislator, you have to have more than a million dollars. Do you have a million dollars? Do your other colleagues and friends in the audience have a million dollars to give you to run for state legislature? Uh, money is swamping uh, this election in bad ways because most of the super PAC money goes to negative advertising. It doesn't go for building up ideas and policies and candidates and so forth. This is also the most extreme internet election we've had, not just with social media, which is the most obvious. And I do, in the winning elections book and other places, I talk it in detail about how it works with voter analytics, nano-targeting, um, and uh, certainly social media that's distinctive. Let me just give one example. Uh, before the first Republican primary, Donald Trump had tweeted 5,000 times, almost hourly, uh, and he had gotten, I don't remember, I think it was 48 million hits, maybe, I may be underestimating it. Millions of people had heard from Donald Trump on Twitter where they had not heard yet the first debate or the first discussion of the primary. And that has continued. It's the same is true on the other side. Hillary Clinton, when she started her campaign, looked like a media startup, like BuzzFeed. Uh, she had five people writing her blog. Full-time writers like Laura were sitting there writing a blog for her. Uh, that's a lot of staff. Uh, there are newspapers in town that would like to have five additional blog writers uh, putting it out. Uh, there just aren't. So, this, and of course you see what's on social media. Uh, at the moment, to go to the outcome of the election, the outcome of the election is likely but not guaranteed because you control the, the outcome. There's enough youth vote to swing this election <coughs> easily. But if we were held the election today, my prediction is Hillary Clinton would win today. I'm not saying she's going to win in November. We're talking about WikiLeaks and other things that can happen, wars, uh, terrorist attacks, uh, economic recession, any number of things could change that. Hillary would win today. She would win Illinois by well past the 5% or so, probably closer to 10%. If she wins by something like f between 5 and 10% margin, that means Tammy Duckworth will be the next U.S. Senator, one of the five seats needed to retake the Senate of the United States and move it from Republican to Democrat. And it would probably mean that we would pick up the two seats in this uh, General Assembly that would guarantee a supermajority that could overcome the veto, uh, could, be, could be able to veto the governor's legislation. We would have a budget for the University of Illinois. We may or may not like it in a perfect fashion, but we would have one. Um, that's a lot to be happening in an election. Of course, all these predictions tomorrow could be wrong because of things could happen in between, but that's where things are going at the moment. So you have to decide, do you want an outcome like that? Do you want a different outcome? And are you willing to do something about it? Um, the outcome of this election turns on one simple thing. It does not turn on public opinion polls. It does not turn on whatever wise remarks we make today. It turns on turnout. 
It's who shows up to vote. It does not matter who might vote for what, who might hate which candidate, uh, what might happen to the political parties after this election. It turns on whether or not you show up and vote election day. Laura, I'll turn it to you. Thank you. Thanks to both, both Ben and Dick for helping set the stage. And I'm, I'm going to be a little briefer so that we can get to some conversation with you because I always learn more from hearing from young people in particular. And I think I had to take my hat off on to, to you, Dick, and to the provost and to the university for what you're doing around engaging your students and faculty uh, around this election. Uh, I, I'm not, I speak on campuses all the time, and I'm not seeing this or hearing this in other places. Sure, activity, but nothing as unprecedented as this. When I was on my way in the building today, I, was, uh, I got onto the elevator, or maybe I was walking behind a student with a backpack, and he had a Hillary Clinton a pretty cool looking Hillary Clinton button that I hadn't seen before. In fact, I haven't seen a Hillary Clinton button around in a long, long time. I had to come to this campus to see it. And that, and that tells, tells you a lot about what's going on this campus, but it also tells you a lot about what may be the lack of enthusiasm that, uh, that would, would generate the turnout that Dick is talking about that's, that's so important to win on either side. Um, as a reporter, I'm going to talk about the latest news story, start by talking about the latest news story that's out there, although uh, given the internet, it changes every millisecond. But uh, you, you probably well. Let me let me f first ask you this because this is important to, to, to sort of gauge engagement here. How many of you are registered to vote? Oh my God! Wow! And that's the, that's the school, I believe. Uh, and how many of you already have already voted? Because we've already started early voting. Okay. Well, that's. You know, early voting, I know the politicians in, encourage it, and it's important because it gets, the, it, it gets their numbers up. It gets their, their, their tally in the, in the basket, so to speak, before the election, because you never know when a WikiLeaks or something else is going to change the conversation. Um, but early voting um, does, in many ways, change the, the tenor of an election because there's so much sort of front-loading that goes on with candidates in terms of trying to get not only get their message out earlier, but get their folks to the poll before they change their minds earlier. And, and, and so early, early voting, I think, is, can be kind of a, a double-edged sword in terms of the most thoughtful uh, decision-making we can make in elections, because things do change every millisecond. Last night, we had a, a debate. Um, VP debates normally aren't marquee events, and they're normally not you know, showstoppers. Uh, an exception to that was uh, eight years ago uh, for the memorable uh, Joe Biden, Sarah Palin debate, which set all records, not only did it set all records in terms of television viewers, but it uh, beat out the other presidential debates in terms of uh, viewership in that cycle. And the reason, there, there, there were many reasons that was a historic election to begin with, but I think the, the big reason was, the, this, was that Sarah Palin was such a marquee candidate in terms of the fact that she was a new, new fresh face, the fact that she was a woman, the fact that the combination of her and John McCain, I think, got generated a lot of excitement. Um, another reason why that, that debate was so important is because of the people at the top of the ticket and the, and the importance of the, of the co a combination. You know, as you know, vice presidential candidates are often chosen to complement or, or add to a ticket. And that was one of, I think, more of the more historic examples of that. Go fast forward to last night. Uh, the pundits were all predicting that uh, last night's debate was going to be the most boring of all the most boring VP debates in history because the perception of the, the two candidates Mike Pence and Tim Kaine were that they were boring, regular guys, not very controversial, not very well known. Even Tim Kaine himself referred to himself as boring when he was around the time he was being uh, selected by Hillary Clinton. Um, it wasn't quite as boring as I think people expected, but it didn't change. I don't think it, it did anything to move anybody's numbers last night. I think uh, I would say, uh, say that Pence won that debate because I think he was more polished, he was more smooth. And he did everything that Donald Trump was not able to do a week ago in his first debate with Hillary Clinton. He didn't take the bait from his opponent. He didn't get angry. He didn't misstate. And the, the most important thing you could do in, a, in any debate is not screw up, not say something that's going to be a headline the next day. Neither one of those candidates did that. But Pence, not only did he, did he stay above uh, the, the, the fray, 
but he also got some of the licks in for Donald Trump. The Donald Trump, again, wasn't able to get in. Donald Trump didn't, didn't address the Clinton Foundation issue. He got to that. Uh, Donald Trump didn't do a lot with the emails. He got to that. He was able to um, put, in, in, and also her, her um, the criticisms about her foreign policy record, uh, the Benghazi thing, uh, she, he got to, the, to that as well. So f for that alone, he won, and, and in, I think in, in particularly in terms of his demeanor. But you know what? That's over. That was last night, and, we, and, and it's, it's already history as, as far as the media is concerned. They've already moved on. In fact, there wasn't much pr promotion of that debate because the media was too busy promoting the one this Sunday, the second presidential debate. So. In the, in the scheme of things, I don't think it's going to make, it's, not, it's, it's, it's going to be another one of those boring ones that's going to go into the, into the wastebasket of boring history in terms of, of, of debate conversation. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, communities of color and people of color in this election. Um, Bernie Sanders has been mentioned um, a couple times, and Hillary Clinton, as you know, had a pretty hot uh, competitive fight with, uh, with Bernie Sanders for the nomination. Bernie Sanders did a great job of attracting the millennials, um, many of the folks that are in this room, and to his side, and many of those people are still standing loyally by his side. Uh, if not for the African American vote, and to some extent the Latino vote, Hillary Clinton very likely would not have been the Democratic nominee. It, 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 I think Bernie, at times Bernie Sanders really had, um, uh, had, uh, had her on her heels because he was able to to bring sort of a new a new a piece of the coalition into into the fold by bringing in the, the millennials, she had to rely very heavily on African American votes in in, in strong urban areas. Uh, interestingly enough, now she's on the same position for the general election, even though traditionally a strong Democrat, someone who has a long history in government and politics like Hillary Clinton and Bill Clinton by her side should have an easy time with the African American vote. But there's not a lot of enthusiasm out there uh, um, uh, among African American voters. And I think that Donald Trump has been very brilliant in some ways in tapping into that uh, and trying to cut into that lack of enthusiasm. Donald Trump's not going to get, you know, 20, 30, 40 percent of the African American vote, but he can certainly win if he can cut enough into her base. And he's been doing that crudely, disrespectfully, but emphatically by talking about crime in African American communities, by talking about economic, the lack of jobs and economic development in African American communities, by calling African American communities hellish and hell holes. And Hillary Clinton has pushed back on that, but there is some truth to those arguments. The, the Democratic Party has been, the black, black voters have, have loyally stepped up to the Democratic Party for decades. And as he would say, look, look at around their communities. What have you really done for me lately? So uh, she's, she's going to have to fight not only really hard for the millennial vote, but she's going to have to fight, I think, even harder. Not so much to, to ensure that she gets the black vote. She's going to get it. But will black voters be enthusiastic? turnout for her uh, at the polls, especially in, a, in an election where um, she, is, she is perceived as, at least she's been painted by her opponent as someone who doesn't really care. Her secret weapon, uh, she's hoping, is going to be the current um, uh, occupant of the office, Barack Obama, who of course is beloved among African American voters. She's counting on him. She's going to be using him a lot on the campaign trail. Also, Michelle Obama will be out there a lot for her. Um, they're going to be making the case, trying to sell her as being someone that you can trust, as someone that's there for you like I was there for you. That's what Barack Obama's going to be saying over and over again. In fact, he's going to be here this weekend. He's going to be spending two days, two nights in, in the city of Chicago. He hasn't done that in a very long time. He usually flies in for a fundraiser here or there. You're lucky if you see him stay overnight. And I think a lot of people in Chicago would just assume that he didn't because of the traffic, and the jams he creates. But he's going to be here to do a, a fundraiser for Hillary Clinton. He's going to do a fundraiser for Tammy Duckworth, the US Senate nominee here. And he's going to be making the case. And the important uh, message by coming here is not just that this is his hometown, and not just that this is Hillary Clinton's adopted hometown, or, or, or hometown in the sense that she grew up in the suburbs here, but that um, he's got to respond to the, the very, I think, potent message that Donald Trump has put out there. You know, what have you done for your neighborhoods? Uh, Barack Obama came from Chicago, and many African American voters could wonder, even though they, he is very beloved by them, 
Um, why is it that our communities have not gotten a more of a leg up in the eight years that you've been in office? So he's got to come here, not just to Chicago, but to many urban areas to get out the vote, to generate the enthusiasm, and to make it count. Um, I think some black voters, uh, Hillary Clinton should be getting the message. If she does win this race, she should get the message because, again, she wouldn't have got even past the primary, primary season without the black vote. But hopefully, uh, if she does get elected, you won't see black voters saying what many African American voters are saying here in Chicago right now. Many African American voters are having some buyer's remorse about our current mayor, who was also sold very hard uh, in two elections to Barack Obama. So uh, we're going to have to wait and see whether or not there's going to be a repeat of that phenomenon. And I think I'll stop there and have some conversation. So we have about uh, seven or eight minutes uh, for questions uh, uh, or things you want the panel to address. Michael, we'll start with you and sure. then just go around. The question for Laura, why do we allow elected officials to get away and what changes in the future? that will actually bring some progress towards our, our communities? Well, I think uh, when you say get away, I mean, what you mean get away in what way? Well, we keep putting them in office and they continue not doing anything. Yeah. You know, I, I, that's a great question. I think because we don't hold them accountable and because we have such low expectations. Um, Dick will, this will certainly resonate with Dick, but I, I did a column a few weeks ago about Rob Agoyevich who, as you know, is in prison for a very long time, 14 years. And um, he's not even halfway through his sentence. And uh, the, the reason I did this column was that he, he had just recently had a court, uh, he, he'd been going into court to try to get, uh, uh, get, get an appeal to get a rehearing of his sentence. He failed. But look at all the, and, and Dick, you could tell, the, you could you run the numbers down better than I. Look at all the folks who have gone to prison, gone to jail, been indicted, been, been convicted from the public sector since that sentence. The judge sent, made, made that harsh sentence with the idea of sending a message to, to elected officials. It, it, it didn't work. They didn't hear the message. So the only, I think the only thing that would work, I think, is to, for, for educated, informed uh, voters to analyze the situation and, and withhold their votes. And I think particularly African Americans have a very challenged time doing that because they feel, particularly among their, their own elected officials, that, the, that those are their chief representatives, they're, they're sort of their li political lifelines, and they hate to turn them out. But you have to turn folks out if they're not representing you adequately, and I think voters have to really step up on that issue. So we'll take as many as we can, go ahead, and then we'll come. Yeah, you, when you say minorities, you mean particularly like a, like a Latino, Latinos and African Americans. Well, you know, I think the polls show that the numbers are fairly low. I mean, in terms of who, of who who's saying that they're going to vote, but, uh, what under yeah. under. Under certainly under 10 percent for like African Americans, three percent African Americans. Some polls, three percent for African Americans. And I mean, my my best friend, like I'm gonna throw her on a bus. I love her, but she's she's half Latino, but she's voting for Trump. Her dad's white, so I'm sure she's like a blind voter. She voted for him, but still. She's a blind voter in the sense that she some vote for him. She doesn't really watch the debate, but like still thinks that he's a good candidate. There you go. There you go. Her dad. She's maybe listening to her dad. Maybe he's a Trump supporter. She's not watching the debate. She's not engaged is maybe you are here on campus with the issues. And um, Trump is a, Trump has presented himself as a very powerful, very successful businessman. He's a celebrity. People love celebrities. They want to, and they want to be with people they perceive as with winners. So I, I would think that that small percentage of, of, of voters is, that's what they're, what's appealing to them. Yes. Uh, my question is for the professor from Northwestern. Um, you talk about how the Republican Party is fractured. Is that going to affect you know, local elections, state legislatures, places where the Democrats have overwhelmingly oh. lost? Good question. That's right, because that's one of the biggest things that's happened in the last decade or so, this huge Republican dominance of state legislatures, kind of under the radar. And the Koch brothers have specialized in that, but there's been a whole lot of money. Well, we'll see, but it, it seems to me the, the fault lines in the party, of course, they differ a little in different places. So you could have a local party that puts something together that's, that's different. But the national problems are very big. 
and the party's got to figure out some way that it's got a national identity. I think it'll hurt. Next question. What kind of real policy do you guys think Trump could pass? Uh, uh, real laws, like for example, this ban on Muslims. I, mean, I don't think he'll be able to pass something like that. I think the courts would throw it out of uh, forcing uh, 11 million immigrants out of the country. I don't think that's practical. What kind of real things would he do instead of just uh, the talks? I think also the media has been showing this, this extreme bigot. But most of what he's saying is kind of. Uh, you know, could be understood both ways. Separate domestic and foreign stuff. Domestically, depending on what happens with the House and Senate, and if he's got Republican majorities, he can do a lot of kind of standard Republican stuff that he wants to do, including regressive tax policy and so forth. On the other hand, he'll, most of the ideas that people think are loony I think you're, you're implying correctly are not going to happen because of separation of powers. Um, foreign policy is a different story. I, I gave a talk like this in China a week and a half ago, and the Chinese are fascinated with Trump. And uh, so people started saying, well, what happens to US-China relations? And that's the kind of thing where, you know, I, I sort of end up saying, well, we could probably live with Trump. We could probably survive domestically. What if he's impulsive in action the way he's impulsive in talk? What if he gets all excited about the South China Sea, you know, and all of a sudden he pushes the wrong button? That's where it seems to me the stakes might be really high. Other questions? Yes. What, um, going off of that, what is the role of Quick, a quick comment on that. It, it seems to me the Russians may have made a tactical error uh, in going against Hillary because she was never all that friendly to the Russians in the first place. But if she's president, she's not going to be happy. Um, one thing we should remember is the United States has a very extensive history of mucking around in other people's elections, almost everybody's, without going into detail. So that we want to sort of keep that perspective. Um, aside from the Russian thing, it's hard for me to think of, of big direct foreign impacts in this particular US election. Your question? Um, I was just wondering, uh, what were your thoughts um, on Bernie Sanders? Um, and more specifically, um, if, do you think that a lot of these millennials that he's kind of activated and brought into the process, so they would be able to Will, will that be just kind of a flash in the pan, or is that going to um, kind of translate into some kind of progressive um, political force? I'll, down the I'll take that one. First of all, I uh, was the state campaign manager for Eugene McCarthy in 1968. Uh, we made a uh, significant error. Uh, the McCarthy people didn't vote for Humphrey, and we got Nixon as president. And so one of the sleeping dangers in this election is that the Sanders people might not vote for Hillary, whether they vote for Johnson or they do something else with their vote or vote uh, for the Green Party, whatever they do. Uh, if a significant number of people did that, then Trump would win. Uh, it doesn't look likely at the moment, but we re don't really know. And so the Sanders voters in particular uh, and that age group uh, that are the primary supporters are very important. On the other hand, um, the uh, when Howard Dean lost the election, he created Democrats for America. And Democrats for America has been fairly successful in organizing at the grass, grassroots level to revitalize the Democratic Party in all 50 states and have influenced the Democratic Party strategies because they had to respond. Howard Dean has a group called, I mean, uh, Bernie Sanders has a group called Our Revolution. Uh, they've not yet been as successful. Their goal is to affect the local and state elections but it's not clear yet that they're going to be able to mobilize their forces. 
It's about time for people to go to other classes, so I'm going to uh, stop us here, come back next Monday, uh, and we will have a full discussion.